one of the most important and influential terms in the 20th century literary criticism is affective fallacy, a term defined by William Wimsett and Monroe Beardsley in their work The Verbal Icon published in 1954. Wimsett and Beardsley defined the term as a confusion between the poem and the results, the poem and its results that is what it is and what it does. It is believed to be the fallacy therefore, a um, crucial error. So, that is what they mean by the word fallacy, a crucial error in evaluating a work of art in terms of its results in the mind of the audience. Um, I will give you an example, very often we judge uh, a poem, uh, a work or a text by its affect, affect as in uh, A double F E C T or the feelings it arouses in us. Um, you must have come across people calling a film or a book, um, any work uh, using certain adjectives such as gut wrenching, heart rending, tear jerker, um, spine tingling. Uh, what do these mean? They mean that the work had a certain effect on the readers or the audience and that is how they respond driven by the feelings that the work aroused in them. So, as a result of judging a work uh, by the effect it produces on us, the poem itself uh, as an object of specifically critical judgment tends to disappear. So, that criticism ends in impressionism and relativism. And now, this is nothing new. Um, Aristotle in his Poetics tells us that great tragedy should produce a catharsis in the spectators the way a work affects us emotionally or the emotional Im impact of a work is called affective fallacy. So, this these things have been discussed in uh, Poetics by Aristotle and he gives us the word catharsis the kind of emotions, the kinds of emotion that are produced in us uh, while watching a work or reading a poem. And uh, for Aristotle, it was all very positive. So, the way a work affects us emotionally or the emotional impact of a work is an affective fallacy according to the 20th century critics. Wimsett and Beardsley. Wimsett and Beardsley wrote their essay in direct response to the great I. E. Richards uh, and his book Principles of Literary Criticism which was published in 1923 and Richards holds that the value of a poem can be measured by the psychological responses it incites in its readers and the essay of the affective fallacy was Beardsley and uh, Wimsett, um, Wimsett's and Beardsley's response to Richards. Next term is ambiguity. Now, you may have come across this word very frequently in, in various places. The work is ambiguous. There is a certain ambiguous ambiguity um, that the speaker resorted to. So, that means, uh, the, the, uh, the sense was not too clear what the, write, uh, what the writer or the speaker was trying to convey. There is a sense of um, duality or um, uh, it is not something very straightforward to put it very simply. Now, in literary criticism, the word ambiguity gained currency since the publication of William Amson's Seven Types of Ambiguity in 1930. For Amson, an ambiguity means something very pronounced 
and as a rule witty and deceitful. So, key words here witty and deceitful. For example, in uh, Lewis uh, Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, Humpty Dumpty uses a word slithy and explains it as a mix of light, l i t h e, and slimy. Now, um, what are we talking about here? It is we are discussing the notion of portmanteau. So, slithy is a portmanteau word which takes parts uh, from two different words slimy and light. So, we uh, it results in a new word slithy. So, literature can mean different things at different times. For instance, Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel Uncle Tom's Cabin meant something different at the time of the American Civil War. So, we all know American Civil War between 1861 and 65, uh, it uh, America was a very different place at the time. So, uh, the word Uncle Tom was generally used in extremely sympathetic tone. However, by 1964 at the time of Civil Rights Act to call someone Uncle Tom was seen as a deadly insult. So, you see uh, uh, the same work of art, same work of literature and how it is received differently at different points, at different periods. Again T. S. Eliot called Shakespeare's Hamlet the Mona Lisa of literature. You see it is very ambiguous, uh, it, it has multiple layers to it, it is not easily decipherable. So, therefore, Hamlet is also um, uh, akin to uh, uh, Mona Lisa. So, um, why? Uh, because every age interprets the play and its complexities very differently. Um, here is how Oscar Wilde reads the play. I cite him from Wilde's text, The Profundus and other writings. So, Oscar Wilde on Hamlet. The Hamlet madness is a mere mask for the hiding of weakness. In the making of fancies and jests, he sees a chance of delay. He keeps playing with action as an artist plays with a theory. He makes himself the spy of his proper actions and listening to his own words knows them to be but words, words, words. Instead of trying to be the hero of his own history, he seeks to be the spectator of his own tragedy. He disbelieves in everything including himself and yet his doubt helps him not as it comes not from skepticism, but from a divided will. So, this is how Oscar Wilde interprets the play. So, what is ambiguity? Ambiguity is a literary device which entails the use of a single word or expression to signify two or more distinct references. So, this is how we define ambiguity. Now, Amson's analysis were further put to use by the exponents of uh, the new criticism. Um, very soon in this course, you are going to get familiar with this uh, concept also, the theory of new criticism. Now, and in 1967, Jacques Derrida tells us in his work, Writing and Difference, that difference is the essence of literary expression. So, you see uh, ambiguity a very successful, very popular and extremely relevant device in literary theory and criticism. I just talked about affective fallacy and if we are talking about affective fallacy, we must talk about intentional fallacy um, also, which is yet another work by the same authors. Wimsett and Beardsley. So, 
this was a kind of a ground breaking criticism by uh, William Wimsett and Monroe Beardsley and they published when they published the work intentional fallacy. In it they counter the contemporary assumption that the original creator's intention for a work was equal to the meaning and merit of the work. Now, these are very important ideas, we must understand them extremely uh, well that uh, they called it a fallacy, an error to interpret a work of art uh, assuming the original creators, the authors, the writers intention for writing that work. So, this raises serious questions in the critical realm about intentionality, okay, autobiography, cultural context and the fixed or unfixed nature of meaning. So, all these works are, uh, are not to be taken according to the assumed intention of the writer. That is what is a fallacy according to these two critics. In the article, The Intentional Fallacy, Wimsett and Beersley write, the design or intention of the author is neither available nor desirable as a standard for judging the success of a work of literary art and it seems to us that this is a principle which goes deep into some differences in the history of critical attitudes. Next word archetype and we also have a very popular um, literary criticism, literary theory the archetypal criticism. What is an archetype? Archetype is a very popular notion uh, in literary criticism. It means original pattern and the Greek philosophers try to explain the concept of archetypal forms such as beauty, truth, goodness, justice. An archetype and uh, we are just attempting to define what is an archetype, it is a pattern, it is a prototype that represents the most typical characteristics shared by a particular class. I um, will give you a few examples and perhaps that would make it uh, better to understand. Uh, Let us think of damsel in distress, that is an archetype. Uh, we know one when we see one, as we know a farm fatal when we see a farm fatal. Don Juan um, is uh, an archetypal womanizer. So, every man who um, has uh, these issues okay, and we call him, uh, we give a very broad generic name, a term uh, to this person, he is a Don Juan, okay, which means he is uh, um, a philanderer. Some of the archetypal patterns and themes include the quest motive, the pursuit of vengeance, trial by fire and redemption rituals. All these are discussed at length, um, for example, in a work, in a work like uh, uh, a Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. We will be talking about these works um, subsequently. Next term is allusion. Allusion is reference to a literary or historical person, place or thing. Allusions rely upon the shared knowledge between the author and his audience and reader. Um, we often assume or the writers often assume that they are talking to um, a set of uh, generally educated readers who will get the allusions they are referring to. It is a sort of a shared understanding 
between the author and uh, um, I'll stretch it a little further. So, between a filmmaker and, in, and his audiences, between uh, an author and his readers. A reader while um, reading the, uh, the work understands what the author is trying to suggest, okay, where he is coming from. Now, let us see how Geoffrey Chaucer opens his uh, immortal Canterbury Tales by alluding to the Italian poet Petrarch. We know that Francis Petrarch was the most distinguished literary author of his time. He was regarded by um, Boccaccio as his revered teacher, father and master and was crowned poet laureate in 1341. Now, Chaucer's Clark's tale closely follows uh, Petrarch's uh, the patient Griselda. So, in Italian it would be the patient Griseldis, uh, Petra's elegant Latin adaptation of the last tale in Boccaccio's Decameron and uh, let us see how Chaucer alludes to Petrarch. This is old English of course, so therefore, you will have uh, uh, some interesting spellings happening here. I will you tell a tale which that I learned at Pedo of a worthy clerk as proved by his words and his work. Francis Petrarch, the laureate poet, hide this clerk which rhetoric sweet and illuminate at a tale of poetry. This is the clerk's prologue from the Canterbury Tales. Now, this is how T. S. Eliot's immortal The Wasteland goes. I will read out a few lines. The chair she sat in like a burnished throne, glowed on the marble where the glass held up by standards, wrought with fruited vines from which a golden cupidon peeped out, another hid his eyes behind his wing doubled the flames of seven branched candelabra reflecting light upon the table as the glitter of her jewels rose to meet it. So, um, what is T. S. Eliot trying to do by referring to Shakespeare? Now, the poet is definitely not trying to impress or dazzle the readers by his phenomenal knowledge uh, of the classics, uh, because we all know that the wasteland is saturated with multiple allusions and references and uh, uh, T. S. Eliot naturally has an encyclopedic knowledge of literature, but by alluding to Shakespeare and Dante and James Fraser and several other writers and poets, uh, Eliot is not trying to um, show off his if I may say, if I may use the word, show off his uh, phenomenal knowledge, but he is trying to assert the tradition within which a modern poet must work and by this I uh, urge you to refer to Eliot's monumental essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent. Uh, coming to more recent times and uh, the art of allusion or the, the literary device of allusion is not just restricted to um, literature. We have uh, the Cohen brothers and the film O Brother Where Art Thou which was a 2000 movie which is based um, on an allusion to Homer's The Odyssey. Again, the title of comic McCarthy's No Country for Old Men alludes to W. B. Yeats's poem Sailing to Byzantium uh, and the poem starts with the lines that is no country for old men. Um, at this point, I would like you to um, look at an assignment and this is your assignment and we expect you to do this work and submit it 
as early as possible. So, uh, please look at the questions. So, uh, this is your assignment. Uh, we would like you to name the allusions in the following titles. You have to tell us from where do these titles the originals. Okay. So, here I go. For whom the bell tolls by Ernest Hemingway, far from the marrying crowd by Thomas Hardy, tender is the night by F. Scott Fitzgerald, of human bondage Somerset Mom, and a passage to India by E. M. Foster. So, please send your responses to us uh, by the deadline. Next important idea that we are going to discuss is base and superstructure which is Marxist in origin. This is essentially uh, a Marxist idea. Um, it means uh, or uh, um, it elaborates that any economic system uh, seeks to perpetuate itself and power holders seek to make us share their ways of thinking, including the idea that it is fitting that they be in control. So, this is a key term in Marxist, uh, thing, Marxist criticism, base and superstructure. Uh, for the Marxist thinkers, base controls the superstructure and is concerned with the means of uh, uh, production. Uh, all of course, all means of production are owned by the bourgeoisie and relations of production where the bourgeoisie exploit the proletariat. Superstructure for the Marxist thinkers, uh, it maintains and legitimates the base. It includes and uh, I am referring to what the Marxist refers to as uh, the superstructure. So, it includes religion, politics, mass media, family and education, everything that has got nothing to do with production in society. Uh, let us also get familiar with another great thinker uh, in the Marxist tradition, Antonio Gramsci. Uh, he gives us the concept of hegemony and for Antonio Gramsci, hegemony describes the winning of consent and supports dominant ideology. Within the western work, it is the white middle class heterosexual male that is the dominant groups that govern. Subordinates are made to see that it is in their general interest to collaborate and collude with that group. This consensus according to Gramsci happens not only uh, by coercion, but also from a desire to belong to a socio-political cultural system. So, this uh, very simply put is the notion of base and superstructure. We move on to talk about another concept that is culture, which is a highly contested term. Um, it was with the publication of Matthew Arnold's Culture and Anarchy in 1867 that uh, the word has come into such a popular discussion and has gained such currency. So, uh, according to Matthew Arnold, culture is the realm of the civilized class. Um, we are not going to get into the discussion of what the civilized class means, but I would urge you to read Matthew Arnold's Culture and Anarchy to have a better understanding of the term. So, cultures are made from the production, circulation and consumption of shared meanings we make and encounter in our everyday lives. Literature and cinema, also music, also popular books are uh, the major con constituents of any culture. We also have a term such as popular culture. Therefore, I use the word popular fiction. T. S. Eliot in his notes towards a definition of culture elaborates on what is culture and he says, if we take culture seriously, we see that a people does not need merely enough to eat, 
but a proper cuisine. So, you see it is not just eating, but what, what is needed is a cuisine. Eating is for the common people, perhaps that is what he means. Culture may even be described simply as that which makes life worth living. Another key writer is Raymond Williams and his Culture and Society published in 1958. And Williams considered canonical literature and cultural works in terms of their role in the development of culture. Okay. All these are um, extremely extensive areas and I would suggest that you read and get familiar. If culture and popular culture studies interests you, then you should be familiar with the writings of Raymond Williams, Matthew Arnold and also German critics Theodor Adorno and Max Hockheimer who are also major names associated with understanding culture studies.